You would like to play Danny's wife? Well, no, but I thought... You would like that to be your wife? Well, it's perfect. Elizabeth's a charming hostess. Why not? <laughs> you think you like that? Very much. You like that, too? Well, I'm willing if everyone else is. And you know what I think? No. Take my advice and get out of his life before you completely ruin it. So you want me to get out of his life? So you can get him yourself? Well, do you know what I think of you? Hello. She hung me up. Ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. It's Ticklish Business, the podcast devoted to honoring and deconstructing classic cinema. As always, I'm Kristen, and we are joined with an amazing special guest this episode talking about his new book, Viva Hollywood, Lupe Velez. Latinos in classic cinema. It is the amazing author, Luis Reyes. Luis, how are you? Fine, fine, Kristen. Thank you very much for having me on this program and me being able to share my thoughts on Viva Hollywood, the new book that will be coming out September 15th on the history of Latinos in the Hollywood film industry. And also the opportunity to talk about uh, Lupe Velez, Luis, I'm always curious when I'm talking to authors, especially classic Hollywood authors, because you guys are doing some amazing work working with materials that are often not easily obtainable. What drew you not just into writing Viva Hollywood, but just being an author in general? What drew me to it was to make it simpler to the point is that I'm a big movie fan. I love movies all kinds of movies, all the actors on the screen I love. But I noticed when I got to Los Angeles that there were very few books on Latinos or even within the regular Hollywood histories, we were not being featured or our role was minimized or overlooked. I had a chance to get to Los Angeles in the late 70s and I joined an organization called Nosotros, which was founded by Ricardo Montalban to help improve the image of Latinos in the Hollywood film industry. I got to meet a lot of these actors and actresses in different situations, mostly at an awards banquet, which was the first awards banquet, which highlighted the accomplishments of Latinos. But I noticed there was nothing written. There was no formal book maybe a line or two on Gilbert Rowland or Lupe Velez, Anthony Quinn, and some of it was tinged with racism or with the biases of the era. They would say that Anthony Quinn's mother was the daughter of an Aztec prince. Come on, things like that. So I felt the need to write about the participation of Latinos. We didn't work in a vacuum. We worked up with all the leading stars of the time. It was a part of the history, of the complete history of Hollywood. We're no better, no worse. It was just telling the story of our participation in the creation and the development of Hollywood. As with other groups, as with Asian Americans, as with Americans of Jewish ancestry, many of them founded the industry. They all had to grapple with in some way, shape, or form with this new industry and having to deal with stereotypes. To answer your question, I felt the need to write this down while the people were still alive. I got a chance to meet Cesar Romero. I got a chance to meet wow. Bill Poland, Ricardo Montalban extensively. We had a chance to get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Longtime listeners of the show know I always have to ask the question when anybody admits that they have met a classic film star, especially somebody that I love, like Ricardo. What was Ricardo Montalban like? He was very much like his on screen persona. He was a very compassionate man, very nice man, very professional in his work ethic. He never had anything to say bad about anybody. I was young and brash, and I remember during an interview, I said, Rita Hayworth is an alcoholic, a drunk. 
And he goes, no, she is very ill. That's the kind of man he was. He told the truth, but he didn't put anyone down. Or he was a very kind man. When we did an interview, he made sure that my tape recorder was working because he had had problems with other people who, after he did a great interview, the recording wasn't working. <laughs> His most important job was the next one he was going to do. He was just a thorough, thorough professional. He knew his lines. He showed up early to the set. He worked very hard and everybody loved him. Because of that, he was able to organize this organization, Los Otros, to help to promote positive images and opportunities for Latinos in the industry. And when they had these events, these award ceremonies, one of the things I loved is all the Latinos worked in Hollywood. So we all worked together with everyone else. When Ricardo had a fundraiser, who was the first one on board? Frank Sinatra, who he himself had experienced prejudice in his early career because he was Italian-American. So he understood. Sammy Davis Jr. Ann Miller was there. Robert Stack. John Hall. All the classic Hollywood people. Contemporaries then, Robert Redford, who was promoting Milagro Beanfield War, everyone showed up. It was star studded. Everybody was there to help, to help correct a situation that had been long going on in Hollywood. That was really important. That's the kind of man he was. And he stood up for what he believed in. And it hurt his career. For a few years there, when he started Nosotros, a lot of producers, people in Hollywood, particularly at that time, don't like to be told what to do don't want to confront biases or racism. Ricardo would say, well, why do you have to make this guy a bandit, a Mexican bandit? They say, oh, but it's more colorful. Those are the answers he got from producers. I mean, there was a major campaign against a character called the Frito Bandito, which was used to sell corn chips. And he said to the people at Frito-Lay at the time, why couldn't he be the Frito Amigo, where he gives the chips away, their consciousness wasn't quite there. It took a while, but they did take the commercials off the air, the Frito Bandito, because it was relying on that old Bandito stereotype. There is this misconception. We talk a lot about classic film and blackface, yellow face. These are things that we are inundated with as a classic film fan. And yet, I'm always struck by how many non-Latino actors played Latino characters in classic film. And that doesn't seem to get talked about as much. When you're putting a book like this together, how did you look at the fact compared to other more overt depictions in classic it's, film? It's still prevalent today. Now we're drug dealers with suits. We're cartel leaders. The stereotypes still persist. Going back to classic Hollywood, first of all, let me dispel a couple of myths. Number one, Latinos weren't forced to change their names. Everybody had to change their name in order to fit into the image that the studios had for them. Some people didn't, but everybody. I mean, John Wayne was not John Wayne. He was Morrison. John uh, Garfield was Julius Garfinkel. Paul Muni was Paul Muninovich or something. So everybody had to change their name to meet the image that they were being created for them. To a certain extent, not everybody. Some people didn't have to. Tyrone Power was Tyrone Power. I didn't realize that Billy Wilder was a German emigre. If you met Billy Wilder, he had a German accent. But yet he wrote the most beloved American comedies. Everybody came from somewhere else, or they were immigrants. It was a new industry. They embraced this new industry, but it was founded on previous misconceptions that people had about other people and groups that had come in. The Latino performers were aware of that, but we're talking about 120 some odd years ago. Times were tough. It was work. They worked in the movies and it was fun for a lot. And for them, they were able to feed their families. There was one actor, he played a bandido so often 
that he had his own bandido costume. Because in those days, if you brought your own costume, they would pay you more. And even non-Latinos, many years later, I would ask a lot of older actors about their careers or ask them for an interview. And they were surprised that anyone was interested in their careers. Some people took it very seriously, the acting and other people was like, hey, it's a job, like going to the office or going to the factory. These stereotypes also, they have their origins in literature. They have their origin in politics. So the rivalry between England and Spain, the American territories, the War of 1812, the War of 1846, the Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War, also the dime novels that were written about the West. And most of them were written by people who had never been West. Had, I mean, people lived in Victorian houses back East and they go out West for the first time and they see people living in adobes and in mud houses. Their conception of a house and a home is totally different than out West and the building materials out West. I was watching Ricardo Montalban in a movie just the other day Looking at his career compared to somebody like you had mentioned, Gilbert Roland, Ricardo often played exotic, quote unquote, characters. He got to use Spanish a little bit, and yet he was never really defined by a location. And there's been a lot of talk about now we look at with specifically Black actors and the concept of passing. Was there something similar to that with actors in the classic era who were Latino? How did actors have to navigate depending on? how they looked, how they sounded. Every actor had the same situation, how they looked, how they sounded. Gilbert Rowland started in the silence and his career went all the way up into the 70s. They navigated pretty well and, and they used whatever they had to navigate within the system. Dolores Del Rio had certain limitations as did Lupe Velez. But then on the other hand, let me give you an example. When Latin lovers or the Latin actors were really in that personality or that persona, there was an actor, a young up and coming actor by the name of Jacob Krantz, who changed his name to Ricardo Cortez. He thought because he was of Hungarian or Eastern European ancestry, but he was dark. So he said, hey, you can play a Latin lover. Let me change my name to Ricardo Cortez. And he did, and he had extremely good success at the beginning of the sound era. Ricardo Cortez did lots of movies. Actually, he starred in the original version of the Maltese Falcon. Yeah, he was a pre-code icon. Yeah, and later became a character actor. Some people were able to change. Other people weren't. Cardo, he was a major star at MGM. He grew up in Mexico, but... He spent his high school years at Fairfax High School here in Los Angeles. He spoke excellent English. He still had the accent, but he spoke excellent. And if you look at some of the photos of MGM circa 1948-49, they had a big photo of all the MGM stars of the period. And in that photo, right next to Clark Gable, Nestor Williams is Ricardo. He was promoted. He hit the cover of Life magazine. MGM was the leading studio. So to be signed by MGM, you couldn't get any better than that. You couldn't get any bigger than being a star under contract at MGM. They paid the most and they gave you everything that you needed to enhance that image that they had of you. The Latinos also were able to play a wide variety of roles because they could play Native American because of their look. They could play Arab, they could play French. So within the limitations, there was a wider scope for Latino actors, though limited, but that consisted of a lot of work. As one actor said, if you were brunette and dark, you played Mexican. And she was grateful to have the work. Another lady who was an extra player, she told me that for her, she could feed her family because they gave you $5 a day and a box lunch. And if they needed extras, her whole family could work. And even her kids could work. That was quite a bit of money at that time. Nicest thing she said was, 
It was like storybooks come to life working in the movies. So that also gave her an escape from the drudgeries of so-called everyday life. You brought up Rita Hayworth earlier. And of course, longtime listeners of the show know I love Lupe Velez, Dolores Del Rio. There's some amazing Latinas that work in classic Hollywood, much like the question I just asked about were there benefits if you didn't have an accent or you were lighter skinned? If you were a woman in classic Hollywood, what was that experience like? I won't say stereotype, but you were boxed into an image. Some actresses specialized, like Rita Hayworth in her early career, because of her dancing ability also, she played the cantina girl in numerous movies. That's one of the reasons why Rita Hayworth changed her image. Also, she didn't have an accent. She grew up in Brooklyn, New York. She was That's my favorite Spanish. Rita Hayworth fun fact. Well, she took her mother's name because she was born Margarita Cancino, but Cancino was her father's name, who was a Spanish dancer. But her mother's name was Olga Haworth because if you see her early film credits, it's Margarita Cancino. First contract was for 20th Century Fox. And she looked very, what we would think of as Latina dark hair and they did the electrolysis for her hairline. And it worked. She didn't deny her heritage. She always told everybody about her Spanish heritage. So she never denied it. It's just what Hollywood required at that time. And that is what helped propel her career. But consequently, even when she went through the electrolysis and all that change, her first big, big role in Technicolor was as the Latin lady, Doña Sol, in Blood and Sand. But her look was completely different. The more traditional Latina look was Linda Darnell. You get the virginal Latina, and then you get the hot Latina. So what's changed? <laughs> Certain things persist. Many would say that we wouldn't have Sofia Vergara today without... Lupe Velez for good or ill. Not only Sofia Vergara, but Fran Drescher, the nanny, that New York Bronx personality that she brings out. Lupe Velez, her career was fortunately, unfortunately, now in retrospect, has been overshadowed by the Mexican Spitfire. But in reality, she was a complete performer, a very talented performer. She performed on Broadway in several Broadway shows. You look at her career, her early career in films, she worked with all the top directors of her time when she was barely 21. She worked with D.W. Griffith, she worked with a director by the name of Henry King, who was a very distinguished director. She worked with all of the top people of her time, Cecil B. DeMille. She worked with the man of a thousand faces, Lon Chaney. And she played with the biggest male star of the silent era, Douglas Fairbanks, who gave her her break in the gaucho. Somebody needs to go in and have a Lupe Velez retrospective from the beginning of her career. I okay. volunteer for Not that. Not just the Mexican <laughs> Spitfire series, because she did a little bit of, she did drama, she did comedies. Also, she did two films in Mexico that are hardly ever screened in Spanish. She was a pioneer in developing the Mexican film industry. So there's so much to her than just the Mexican Spitfire. Even though she did extremely well, people love that character. That same characterization as Fran Drescher, or as, as you said, Sofia Vergara, sometimes verges on stereotype, but people like those characters. They're, they're familiar to them. They know those characters. Her Mexican Spitfire was very independent. She was an independent woman. She decided to get a job and work and make her way on her own. She didn't need her American boyfriend who later became her husband. She needed help from a lot of people, but she did it on her own. 
she would speak Spanish. If you watch those movies, man, she gets away with a lot of expletives that the Spanish speaking audience knows what she's saying. And but the American audience is just gibberish. They don't understand it. Oh, she's just getting excited, but they don't know that she just called this lady a cara de perra, dog face, <laughs> or gringa. She's underrated, and there needs to be a retrospective of her work to really bring her whole career into focus. I have no idea how to pull that off, but I feel I need to pull that off. I'm agreeing with you 100%. Even in contrast to Dolores Del Rio, her comedy timing. I just watched Hollywood Party for the first time. And oh. To see her act opposite Laurel and Hardy. Yes, and that uh, sequence. Oh, yeah. Man. That's a classic standalone sequence. She holds her own. It's so funny. The costume is beautiful. She's one of my favorites, and it just angers me every time somebody brings up that Hollywood Babylon story of, isn't she the one that died in her toilet? And I'm like, no, actually, that is a false story that we need to put to bed because it's horrible. To watch something like Dolores Del Rio in a comedy, it's not physical comedy. It's far more maybe like a romantic comedy where she is the girl. and She's great, the love interest, but Lupe gets to actually create action in so many ways, which is really amazing to see. Well, have you ever seen her later films, just the two films she did before she died, Honolulu Lou, where she I have not a... been able to get my hands on that. I want yeah. to, though. She co-stars with Leo Carrillo, another Latino star. She also did a baseball comedy called Ladies' Day with Eddie Albert. I have seen Ladies' Day. Ladies' Day is fun for what it is. My one big piece of Lupe merch is an original poster from Ladies' Day that I am in the process of getting framed, and I'm very proud to give it a home. Oh, great, great. Her work is amazing. It's a shame that like, you're absolutely right. The Mexican Spitfire and her untimely death is what has overshadowed her career. It's no different than Marilyn Monroe in many ways. Marilyn Monroe is this tragic figure defined by her demise as opposed yes. to the work. Now we're seeing a critical reevaluation of Marilyn as a performer. And who pays due for that same critical reevaluation? Absolutely. Oh, and we forgot to talk about the film she did that propelled the career, not so much her, because she was already established, but young Gary Cooper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Called Wolf Song, in which they had a torrid affair, not only on screen, but off screen that lasted several years. And then her volatile relationship with Johnny Weissmeller played Tarzan and former Olympic swimming champion. So there's so much to her facets of her life, her career that really needs critical evaluation. Material needs to be seen because most of her work has not been seen, except for her latter work, overshadowed by the Hollywood Babylon and that urban legend about her in the toilet, when in fact, she didn't. They found her on the floor or on the bed. Say she was elegantly composed on her bed, which sounds like something Lupe would have done. <laughs> yeah. And they said that she took so many barbiturates that she would not have been able to get out of the bed or gone to the bathroom. And that also brings up questions in the biography that was done on her. They suppose that maybe she was bipolar. That well, always seems to get thrown at women in this industry. Veronica Lake got the same designation. I don't know, but they said she might have been because of her behavior. It's strange that someone who had such a strong personality and the circumstances that are brought out in the book, why she would have killed herself. If she was pregnant, yes, the reveal of her being pregnant might have hurt her career at that point, but she had a sister who could have taken the baby, said that it was yeah. hers. We've Hollywood seen that happen. Covering up things. I had always heard rumors that allegedly it might have been Gary Cooper's baby that they had gotten back together for a tryst. 
and that it wasn't necessarily that she was ashamed of being an unwed mother, but that Gary Cooper, I think, was married at the time. That would have been the scandals. Who knows? I don't know. It's weird that somebody who perceived as being such a strong person would have committed suicide because she was not only strong on screen, but she was also a strong personality. And apparently a staunch Catholic as well. Yes. And even though that might have caused a problem emotionally, I don't know, maybe people that we feel are very strong are in fact very vulnerable and we don't realize that. It's hard to say, but if she had not perished, she her career would have gone on because her career was not at a low point. At that point, she was still doing films, major films. Rightly so, someone had said that she probably would have gone into TV. That instead of I Love Lucy, it might have been I Love Lupe. I've been so, so into that, that. That's very possible. Insane personality, Latina would be with an American husband would have been exactly what I Love Lucy was about, except in reverse. Cutting in briefly to talk about our Patreon. If you're a fan of everything we do here at the show, old Hollywood, classic film, pop culture, consider subscribing like these wonderful patrons, Peter Blitzstein, Laura Stalker, and Foster and Harry Holland. Our Patreon page is located at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. If we can reach 30 subscribers, you will be treated to a full episode looking at the 1976 TV biopic Gable and Lombard, starring Jill Clayburgh as Carol Lombard and James Brolin as Clark Gable himself. Please consider subscribing to Ticklish Biz and help us reach that goal so we can talk about it. If we get to 100 subscribers, we're looking forward to posting a deep dive into one of Kristen's most infamous classic quote-unquote films, Does Love Truly Mean Never Having to Say You're Sorry?, If we get to 100 subscribers, you'll get to hear all our opinions on Love Story. Meanwhile, we have all sorts of special content, including our dual shows, doubled features, and based on a true podcast, as well as the series we just concluded, Being Elvis, looking at all of the Elvis biopics, including Baz Luhrmann's 2022 feature of the same name. Patrons also get access to special buttons, as well as free DVDs, and Blu-rays throughout the year. So again, why don't you take a chance and visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, see what you like, and hopefully we'll see you in our Patreon winner circle soon. Now, back to the show. To look at even Desi Arnaz's career, I call him the male Lupe in many ways because much like Lupe in her comedy films, Desi Arnaz playing the straight man in I Love Lucy, but it's... Yeah. Still a lot of the same humor of the fact that there's this communication barrier between him and Lucy. He can be a hothead at times. It's amazing that you can chart so many different actors that have careers that go back to some of the actors of the silent era that we just don't talk about anymore. (laughs) Again, we're dealing with the new generation. I mean, when I talk to kids now, they know Ricardo Montalban from... Star Trek, Trek Wrath yeah. Con, or as the grandfather in the Spy Kids movies. That's, That's right, it. he is. <laughs> okay. They don't know. They think that Latinos started with Edward James Olmos <laughs> and Andy Garcia. Those are the leading men, the older guys for this generation now. They don't know about Anthony Quinn. It's a process What I try to do with Viva Hollywood is to reintroduce these Latino actors, many of them Latino or what we call American Latinos or Latin A or Latin X to a new generation and also give them the spotlight to where they might have been overlooked or underappreciated. And it's so vital. I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. Desi Arnaz doesn't have any biography written on him. The only book that exists about him outside of talking about his time with Lucille Ball and Desi Lu is his autobiography that he wrote himself in the 70s that is now out of print. That's why your book is so vital because a lot of these performers, they don't even get biographies anymore because the book industry is one of those where it's so reliant on, much like film, name recognition. That if, oh, well, you're not a big name that's going to sell thousands of copies, who needs another Desi Arnaz book? Which is frustrating because it limits how people learn about these amazing talent. 
that it makes books like Viva Hollywood even more important. I want to stress that with Viva Hollywood, we highlight mostly the classic films and also Hollywood's classic films. We don't go into TV very much. Right. Unless there's an overlap. So there may be a lot of people that are missing some of your favorites that are not in the book. This wasn't supposed to be a comprehensive book. It was focusing on the classic Hollywood films and some of the achievements and some of the people that went unrecognized. Since we're in that era right now, one of the big hit movies is Elvis. A lot of people don't realize, and I put it out in my book, that people remember the Jailhouse Rock musical number from Jailhouse Rock. Well, that was choreographed by a Latino choreographer at MGM by the name of Alex Romero, who did a lot of work as an assistant choreographer at MGM. So he choreographed that sequence for Elvis utilizing the traditional moves that Elvis did on stage because Romero noticed that he's not going to be able to do the kind of stuff that Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire do. So he said, Elvis, show me what you do on stage. And Elvis showed him and he goes, okay. And he incorporated those moves that are natural for Elvis into that sequence. And then he backed them up with professional dancers. So it's one of the memorable sequences of and highlights of Elvis's career. A Latino, Alex Romero, was the one who was inspired to do that. So that's a memorable teaming. So you watch King Kong, the original King Kong, 1933, the classic. There were Latinos behind that, too. Willis O'Brien was the one who brought the stop motion animation together. But there was a man by the name of Marcel Delgado who actually sculpted the King Kong models that were used in the film. And he also sculpted the hand that grabs Fay Ray and Kong's head in, in, in larger size for close-ups. People don't realize that Latinos were behind that. And also a gentleman by the name of Mario Larinaga who went on to become an acclaimed artist out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. He was a background artist at RKO Studios. He worked on all the backgrounds. When you see Kong in the jungle, in the foreground, it's trees and everything in the foliage, but in the background, the mountains were all painted. They call them matte paintings. And they were done by Mario Larinaga, who worked at RKO Studios. The girl in Casablanca, the Bulgarian girl who wants the papers to the letters of transit. Mm -hmm. She is Latina. She played the character of Anina Brandel. Bogart listens to her when she talks to him about what if a girl did something wrong because Colonel Rel Note is trying to have sex with her in exchange for the papers. She talks to Rick and she tells him that all the little money that they have left, her husband's trying to win enough money to be able to buy the letters of transit. Bogart feigning interest allows her husband to win. He feels sorry for her. That's when we first get to know Rick. Nina Brandel, the girl who plays her, is an actress by the name of Joy Page. And this was her first film. She is the daughter of Ann Page and an actor by the name of Don Alvarado. But his real name is Don Page, and he's from... Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he changed his name from Don Page to Don Alvarado because the Latin lover thing was in and he had the looks. He had a successful career in the late silence and early sound films. And then he went into assistant directing at Warner Brothers. Ann Page, they divorced. They had the daughter, Joy Page. Ann Page later married the head of Warner Brothers, which was Jack Warner. And that's how Joy Page got that role. Obviously, she was adequate. She was good for the role. You know, she had that sweet innocence to her. And she had a career in Hollywood, but she was Latina, American Latina. When and you're yeah. working with such 
an amazing group of stories. Was there somebody that you wish you could have included that just for time page count you couldn't include or did everybody that you wanted to include make it into the finished product? Everyone's included, if, if not photographically to some part, or they're mentioned. But I did not go into Fernando Lamas. First of all, I was limited in words and in space. Always. So, <laughs> it's choices you have to make. I didn't feel that he was a significant enough presence. He didn't have a classic Hollywood film or body of work. So I did not put him in, in the book. Not that he wasn't worthy of it. Various others, no one comes to mind. There were others that I might have wanted to spotlight further, but I did mention them. Hector Elizondo, very, very good actor. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Has an amazing body of work. I included him when I was talking about Raquel Welch. Raquel Welch, when you look at her body of work, there aren't that many classic films. But she was an overwhelming presence. Her sexuality, her persona. When I was growing up, I had her poster from One Million Years B.C. in my room. So she was an overwhelming presence. She was the last of the studio manufactured sex goddesses. So she was important. She did work with a lot of important people. But as far as classic films, One Million Years B.C., a classic film. I don't know. Her work, definitely a major presence in the 60s and 70s. So with Hector Lizondo, I mentioned him. I was able to mention him with a film he did with her called Tortilla Soup. And I mentioned the fact that he had worked for a long time, taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3. He played Detective Sunshine in the film with Richard Gere. And then probably his best known as the hotel manager in Pretty Women. I was going to say The Princess Diaries for and my the generation. Princess Diaries with Julie Andrews. He's there, but I didn't have the space to really spotlight him. You have to know your audience. It's not an academia book. It's for movie lovers. It's a different type of book. I try to bring a sense of authenticity because I did know a lot of these people. I was privileged enough to come to Hollywood when it was going through its last classic Hollywood stages, the studio system. And so I got to meet a lot of the old timers. Now I'm an old timer myself, but I was able to meet a lot of the major stars of today. I worked with Selma Hayek on her first movie. I worked with Jennifer Lopez on her first television series and her first film called Mi Familia, Jimmy Smith's a lot of the main actors of today I've been able to work with, and I've seen the Edward James almost. I worked with him on Zoot Suit and the Ballad of Gregorio Cortez and American Me. So I'm able to see the progression of these actors through the years and the staying power and what they've accomplished and also some of the setbacks that they've been through and also the new young people that are coming up, like Michael Pena, Pedro Pascal, Oscar Isaac, Ana de Armas, who's consequently going to be starring in a Netflix film where she, a Latina, is playing Marilyn Monroe, yep. which is uh, quite something to see. Luis, you might just be the coolest person we've had on this show in a minute. You know, everybody cool. To go back to the beginning, the reason for this book, considering that I think when people hear Latinos in classic film, Think of Carmen Miranda. What do you hope that people who read Viva Hollywood will take away about classic film, Latinos in the industry, all of it? Latinos have been in Hollywood since the beginning, since the start of Hollywood, 120 years ago. So we're not recent arrivals. We've been a part of this industry since the beginning. And we've been involved in front of the camera and also behind the scenes. And there's a history and a trajectory. I'm one of these people that believes an actor is an actor and should be able to play any role that he's qualified or that he, is, he can make believable. So I don't just believe that Latino actors should play Latino parts. An actor is an actor, and if it works, it works. If the audience believes it, that's fine. But 
there were biases, there were societal views that hindered careers on all levels. If people can see the trajectory of what happened in the past and what is happening now, all the people that have come through Hollywood, that we've enjoyed their movies, their performances, that there was some kind of representation. We were there. Every Western, there's always a senorita. There's always a Mexican vaquero or a bandido or a Spanish nobleman. In urban dramas, we're there. And people have been able to move their careers through different roles. Alfonso Bedoya played the ultimate bandido, and he worked for another 10 years in all kinds of Westerns. Everybody said, I want that Alfonso Bedoya guy. In Rio Bravo, there's another actor, Pedro Gonzalez Gonzalez. He played the hotel keeper, and he was in dozens of Westerns. Is the funny little Mexican guy. He got to start on the Groucho Marx show as a contestant. But interesting enough, he was illiterate. His wife had to read the script for him. So imagine a guy who was illiterate was still able to make it in Hollywood. Amazing. Lots of fascinating stories that I wanted to be told. Pedro Armendariz, who was the Mexican leading man. He was Mexican, but his mother was American. He went to school at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. So he spoke perfect English. He was buddies with John Wayne and John Ford. He did Ford Apache. All of these great stories of all these actors, and they worked alongside one another. That's what's important, that we were part of the industry. We are still part of the industry. There's still a long way to go as far as stereotypes, especially in films. There's not enough of us in major roles in film. We have a great group of actors and stars, but we're not getting the major roles in films. Television is another animal. We're doing very well in television. The, my ultimate actor on television is Jay Hernandez on Magnum P.I., because he's just a brown guy <laughs> playing Magnum. They don't make a thing about him being Latino. They don't bring in a family member that happens to be Latino. He's just an actor playing a character, and that's it. And he does it marvelously. His ethnicity or his color doesn't become part of the storyline. He's just like any other actor playing a character. That's where we need to be, and we need to see more of that. But we also need to, when there is a choice role for a Latino, we should be at least given the consideration of being able to handle that role, or at least be considered. Again, there are economic situations, economic considerations. That is another situation that needs to be rectified. People, oh, no, 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 we can't have a Latino in that part. Why not? It's a business and it's an art form. Now more than ever for a global audience. Yes, Latinos make up a large portion of the box office. We need to be able to develop our talent develop maybe stories that center around Latino characters that will entertain characters who are not stereotypical. They're human. They're interesting stories, nuanced. People will buy into it. People will love it. La Bamba was one of the biggest hits. So Selena, there's room for representation and there's room for entertainment. I think we can fulfill all of those goals. Please. The biggest hits for HBO right now is The Father of the Bride with Andy Garcia. Great movie. It's a fun movie. It's touching. It deals with differences within the Latino American culture or Cuban American and also the Mexican culture. So there's a culture clash of values, a fun movie. And as a diverse cast, young cast, older cast, I mean, Gloria Stefan is in it. A lot of young performers, and one of them is a very handsome guy, Diego Boneta, who's Mexican, but he doesn't have an accent. He looks like a white boy. Luis, I know the book doesn't come out till September 13th, 
But right. in the meantime, where can fans learn more about it, get in touch with you on social media? I don't have a website yet. I'm still a dinosaur when it comes to social media. <laughs> I have a Facebook page called The Hawaii Movie and TV Book. And then I have another page under Luis Reyes. This is my fifth book. My last book was called Made in Mexico, which is about all the Hollywood movies that were shot in Mexico. Not Mexican movies, but Hollywood movies shot in Mexico. You've seen Titanic, right? Oh, definitely. Yes. Okay. People don't realize that except for the principal players, everybody on that ship is Mexican. They got the most European, whitest looking Mexicans they could find to play the upper class people on the ship. And then when Rose and Leonardo go down to steerage, they got the darkest Mexicans to play the Greeks and the Italians and the Poles that were coming to America at that time. The reason is that the movie was shot totally in Baja, California, Rosarito. They constructed a studio there and Mexicans, technicians, assistant directors, all contributed to the success of that movie. What's okay. still a tourist attraction down there too, yes, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. It's, it's, and before then I did a book which has been my most successful book. It's called The Hawaii Movie and TV Book, which is about all the movies and television shows that were filmed in Hawaii. And it deals with everything from That's from here to eternity to the original Hawaii Five-O to the original Magnum miniseries like the Thornbirds, the Adam Sandler film, 51st Dates, Jurassic Park, <laughs> the traditional ones like Blue Hawaii with Elvis. And it deals with the actors and the actresses. I located many of the locations where they were filmed. So if you go to Hawaii, you can go to from here to Eternity Beach. Another book 25 years ago, which brought me to the attention of Turner Classic Movies. I did a book called Hispanics in Hollywood, which was a more comprehensive encyclopedic book on the history of Latinos in Hollywood. It was one of the first books to document the participation of Latinos in the film industry. Well, I can't wait till September 13th and I can read the finished product. Luis, thank you so much for sitting down and talking to me about Ricardo Montalban, Lupe. It's been such a treat. Thank you very much. That's going to close out this edition of Tick Wish Business. As always, we are on all social media platforms. So send us an email at ticklishbiz at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter at ticklish underscore biz, as well as Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at ticklishbiz. You can listen to our episodes wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Help us out. We have not gotten a review since the beginning of the year. We would love another one. And if you enjoy our episodes and want to give us your money, you can do that at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Becoming a patron at just a dollar gets you some amazing pins as well as access to updates on what we're doing and getting to hear episodes a whole two days early. You also get access to our bonus shows based on a true podcast, as well as doubled features. We just wrapped up our six-week series on being Elvis, and we have just released an episode in the last couple of days aimed at summertime. Doubled features look at Against All Odds and Out of the Past, which was really fun to talk about. So consider helping us out over there at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. If we get to a certain amount of followers, we will talk about 1976's horrible biopic, Evil and Lombard. We also would love to do an episode on Love Story. And Samantha would love to watch any Little Women and or The Godfather. So help her enhance her classic film education. Tickwish Business will be back in two weeks with a new episode. Till then.